so in this final session I really want to talk about monitoring and evaluation um, both what it means in terms of the sort of design approaches and implementation approaches we've been talking about and what are some of the common uh, considerations that you need to give attention to. I think it's really important to, um, to reiterate that we've been skating across the top of a whole range of issues here, um, both um, issues around analysis but also design, implementation and now monitoring and evaluation. So it's giving you just simply a taste of some of these areas. But I think it's worth trying to, um, to continue and, and um, think about, <coughs> excuse me, from a complex perspective, from um, a more engaged perspective with some of these different uh, approaches to social change. What do we need to think about when we get to this monitoring and evaluation stage? <coughs> so, um, uh, just remembering that when we talked a little bit before about theory of change and theory of action, I suggested that um, this, uh, the design approaches then become quite challenging because it's not simply about writing down a problem and a solution, it's about how do we communicate in perhaps a document and other forms this notion of what we think is the theory about how change might happen, what we consider is our starting point, the people we might want to work with and how we might do that in different um, strategies around uh, that include coalitions or engaging with social movements, how we're going to broker and convene in that, how we're going to include a range of people and then how we're going to work in iterative and adaptive ways so that we learn as we go. Um, and one of the problems is that while we've done a lot of thinking about what's wrong with the traditional approaches and what's wrong with um, traditional ways of, of acting for change, we haven't got very far with thinking about new design approaches. How do we communicate and how do we write down and how do we make sense of this in a way that um, helps other people to come along with us? So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. I think that's something that needs to be much further explored, but I think my experience is that good designs create space for development work. So they try and create the right conditions for good development workers to move forward in learning and iterative and adaptive ways. And part of that is having um, a, an implementation plan in the design um, that's based on your strategy or theory of action that really helps you to understand about what you're trying to achieve and, and how you're going to do the work. So an implementation plan that does more than say uh, go and fix this or fix that. And there's sort of very many versions of these um, but I'm going to really simply categorise them and you can do some more exploration in the reading around this. There's, there's versions that really take a linear planning system and they, they tend to be based on the traditional log frame approach or um, planning by objectives approach, which takes us back to that notion that change is a linear process that you can plot and map and understand. Um, it's usually based on a problem analysis approach. And ag again, like I said, if we go back to this notion that some of the uh, air problems that we have to solve or some of the issues we engage in are actually in a simple context, linear planning works in those. So you might be working in a refugee camp where you're trying to deal with political realities and safety and violence and um, trying to, to um, organise to get access for food to come in, trying to keep um, medicines um, protected from warlords, but at the same time you might within that have um, a simple process of vaccinating kids. And so planning around that aspect, that if you like relatively simple task within this much more complex area, I might use a linear planning approach, a log frame approach. We've got to do this, this and this, that'll lead to these outputs and that'll then give us this outcome, kids are vaccinated in this place. So linear planning has its place, um, as long as we understand the limitations and as we understand how to do it well. Another approach that is increasingly used in a lot of development, particularly in order to try and communicate what you're going to do, your implementation plan to outsiders, is a systems approach. And this fits more of into the complicated um, uh, context where you say, okay, there's a lot of interaction, a lot of variables here, but I can basically map them out and I can show you what my plan will be, what my strategy will be, what my way of, of tackling change will be in this situation. And again, in a lot of very complex contexts, there will be systems that you, or, or um, systemic plans that you can work on that address a particular issue. 
you might be in your refugee camp, you might be trying to set up an education um, um, section so that the kids can go to school, or you might be trying to set up a basic health clinic so that women and children can get um, a basic health care. And there'll be aspects of that which you can systematically map and understand, work out the various things that you need to do. And so you acknowledge that perhaps there are interactions that you won't understand in that, that systems can change, things are fluid, you've got to be able to, uh, to think on your feet because you might get the education system working one day and then your head teacher might get you know, the opportunity to, to go to Australia as a refugee and so you've got to rethink things. But systems do fit more of that complicated sort of set of problems where you can say, this is my implementation plan. Of course, we also have a very complex world and often we're working with a whole range of other people. Like I said before, if we're trying to deal with bigger problems, again, in the refugee camp, you might have um, some coalitions working where you've brought together particular leaders of different factions and um, some of the religious leaders and perhaps um, representatives of some of the, the women's groups to actually work on particular problems around safety and access to get the food into the camp. Um, you might have had to negotiate with the warlords who are outside the camp or the, the army to make sure that they're bribed and um, have their needs met so that you can keep some safety going in the camp. There might be many different groups that you have to work with. Um, and so we, we're then getting into a much more complex set of interactions where you don't have control, you're not necessarily the, um, the one who's actually creating the solution or working on it. And then I'd argue that an implementation plan ought to be much more iterative or what we call an action reflection approach, which is to act on the best knowledge, uh, reflect on what's working and then um, start to change and adapt. And many large designs that are working in um, complex problems with other people would probably have elements of all of these three. And you'd actually be explaining to the people who are trying to fund and support you these are the areas where we know we're going to do this, this and this to start with. These are the areas where we're going to experiment and explore. These are the groups we're going to work with. These are the systems we might engage in or the coalitions and groups we might work with and they'll be trying this and this. So your implementation plan can often be quite complex, but helping to think through which of the tools that you might need to make sense of how you're going to operate um, begins to give you some sort of structure to it all. Now this presents all sorts of challenges for monitoring and evaluation. Traditional monitoring and evaluation basically says we know what we want to do and so we just need to think methodologically about how we're going to, to track that. So, um, you know, and your overall purpose is to um, be accountable. So it's either it's accountability up to the people who gave you the money or it's accountability um, and or it's accountability to the people who um, are part of the program and to whom you're accountable for good services. Um, when we start to get into more complex situations, there are a whole lot of other m &E challenges that start to emerge. Often there are quite multiple purposes for monitoring and evaluation in these situations. So not only do we need to provide accountability, but we need to learn because we're using an action reflection approach and we need to know what's worked, what hasn't, why, who was involved, what's going on here, um, how have things changed. We need to understand the people we're working with and the coalitions we might be engaging in or the people we might bring in together and whether they're the right people, whether they remain the right people, whether they're in fact um, working in ways that get us the best uh, outcomes or they're more predatory in their operation. We probably need to think about monitoring and evaluation that helps us communicate what we're doing. You've got this messy program working with different aspects and different groups and you're trying to keep your funder happy, trying to make sure that they think that um, the whole process is worthwhile and worth continuing to fund. So your M&E, your monitoring and evaluation and your learning might need to contribute to the communication. So there's different purposes you've got to manage. What's the scope and focus? Like there's so many things that you could actually talk about and think about in monitoring and evaluation, but what are the most important? What are the, the, the key questions or the key areas of inquiry that we need to know in order to manage this program and to progress it towards where we want to achieve and to make sure that we do no harm, that we maintain support for it and so on. How do we involve um, other people? So if our basic assumption is it's working with others uh, is the way that we're going to address change and create um, the sort of social 
conditions or the opportunities for change and that largely it has to be under their control. How do we do that within our monitoring and evaluation too? Because we can't work in coalitions and ways that hand over control and then extract it when we want to measure things and assess things. We've got to work out ways of actually being, people being involved in that and learning for themselves and actually creating their own opportunity to understand what they're achieving and what they're not. And then what does that mean in terms of measurements? It's going to be very difficult to always get numbers in a situation like this, particularly in the short term. You know, change is a long term process, it's a complex process, it goes up and down. In fact, your numbers might look worse for a while if we're talking about um, a situation of trying to address violence or um, deprivation. It might be that your program raises awareness for a long time and actually raises the numbers as people come and look for services. And so numbers and tangible measures are going to be perhaps difficult. Adding them all up so that we can say, overall, this is what happened. Aggregation is probably going to be difficult in, um, initially. Sorry, I have to keep the lights on. So um, trying to understand how you're going to um, get analysis of what's going on. So again, if we assume that we don't know what we only have a theory about how change happens and we need to rely on the insights and views of others and we need to constantly be learning and, and engaging with others, how do we build that into our m and &E so we're not making the wrong judgments about what the results tell us? And then how do we both measure process and um, what we're doing as well as the outcomes? And then how do we communicate this to organisations and, and up to, uh, to those who are funding us and so on? So some ideas around ways of getting more effective monitoring and evaluation, particularly in complex situations. And these are just a few ideas that come out of um, practice examples. Really trying to understand a theory of change that explains the partnership or the coalitions and um, the need for bringing different groups together. So a theory of change that um, talks about how, what drives change and what might be possible, who are engaged, and then why therefore you're engaged with these people. Being able to do a bit of everything is really important, I think. So being able to tap, capture some of the short-term results and processes so that um, outsiders and indeed people who are engaged in the program can get some comfort and see some sense of what they're able to achieve, as well as realise that this could be a very long-term relationship and long-term uh, engagement that you might be involved in. And so having measures that capture different elements of the program and different points of change and different aspects of change is important. Um, Understanding how relationships and processes contribute to long-term change and tracking that. Making sure your M&E is very timely so that um, information doesn't take two years to be analysed and feedback, but it's something that feeds back into management processes. Making sure there's communication involved and making sure you've got a right amount of resources. So a lot of the big questions that you might be engaged in trying to understand or trying to make a difference about probably won't lend themselves to simple M&E and uh, m and &E approaches, and you need to think about research approaches. And one of the things that we do a lot now as part of the Institute is we accompany programs and help them undertake um, both action research and some longer term research alongside their month to month monitoring and evaluation and other processes. So we acknowledge there needs to be a whole suite of processes to really make sense of what's going on. Some of the tools that um, I just wanted to, to briefly mention that I think are really useful to think about when you get down to the technical m and &E are things like um, outcome mapping, and you can go away and read about this for yourself, but basically the, the focus in outcome mapping is to really look at the changes in behaviour of people. So let's really think about what they call the boundary partners, those people who you most want to affect, um, who you most want to see changed in this situation and how is their attitudes and behaviours actually changing. So that will give us a really um, clear indicator that we're starting to have some of the other changes and influences happening in the way that we want. And we, we probably can't measure all the, all the elements and, and uh, ways that that might have happened, but if we can see that change, then all these other things must be working in some ways. Another one that um, is quite useful, although a bit more complex to use, is network analysis. And that mu looks much more clearly at what we've been talking about before, which is this notion that it is the interactions between people that both drive change but also give you the potential to change things and to make things different. 
And if you understand those networks and relationships and start to see how they might be shifting, how you might be getting different perspectives in and power being shared in different ways and opportunities being opened up for people, you map that, um, then you can start to understand what changes might be happening. So it, it suits programs that are actually working with um, coalitions and networks of change, um, but it can also be something that you can use uh, within programs where you're perhaps not measuring the coalitions that you're working with, but you're measuring some of the other interactions, maybe the opportunity for that coalition or group of people to interact with formal political um, players or with other power brokers, and the relationship and, and uh, networks that are growing between those might be an indicator of the way opportunities for change are now opening up. So again, I encourage you to go and read it. So I think the last slide I wanted to show you was this one around the politics of evaluation and uh, it's almost like I need to end where I started, which is to say traditional um, aid and development basically suggests that we, um, we understand the world, we understand the problems, we have some resources here, we will take these resources and you know with good design and technical inputs we'll go and, and apply them in other countries for poorer people, people without resources, and we will solve their problems and enable them to develop. Now, that's fast becoming, if it ever was valid, it's fast becoming a very invalid way of understanding both change and, and what people in the world require, and indeed what we require in our own country, and what needs to happen. And basically the notion is that development is a very political process. It's a process that's driven by power, by culture, by ideas, by opportunity and by the will and, and um, political will of uh, both leaders and, and um, uh, citizens. So similarly, evaluation and monitoring is political um, because all evaluations or all monitoring systems have to operate within that world and they operate within those constraints. Um, they all engage with social relations and decisions. It, you can't make a judgment without it having an effect. So if you talk about a program achieving this and this and um, giving this value, you put a value on it. Um, they have consequences for staff and for people and indeed for the, the human beings that you're trying to assist. Um, in the long term, that means might mean that it has uh, impacts upon very senior decision makers. So the uh, closing the gap strategy and the measurement of that has been a good example of that. The way that's been raised regularly, the, the failure to achieve the closing the gap targets in Australia for um, uh, better achieve better well-being for Indigenous Australians, has been something that has been used to um, criticise and, and um, um, challenge senior politicians here in Australia on a regular basis. And so uh, it's very political that sort of um, evaluative process. So. At the end of the day, a monitoring and evaluation doesn't become something that separates itself out and, and sits aside from all these discussions about complexity and relationships and coalitions. Monitoring and evaluation itself is inherently political and it's absolutely critical that we think about the politics of this as we operate. Thank you.